Okay, so there's really nothing that I want to say about this book other than go read it and then talk to me because this is all I've been thinking about for like the past week and a half. Welcome to our <laughs> review of Gideon the Ninth by Timison Muir. Ha, uh, hello future. <laughs> How is September? <laughs> yeah, it's like... July still? <laughs> yeah, it's July right now. It's very warm. I don't have AC. It's fine. So, Gideon the Ninth has been my most anticipated release of 2019. I've been following this book since Tor announced it. It was like the one book that I needed. <laughs> <laughs> like she fought tooth and nail to get this book at Book Expo. It was like, okay, they're dropping the tickets, nine in the morning, and she's like, I don't care what's in my way, I will get there. And we did, we got there, we were basically the front of the line, got our tickets, and we got our book. So Gideon the Ninth, the like blurb for this book is, and I quote, Lesbian necromancers explore a haunted gothic palace in space. Decadent nobles vie to serve the deathless empire. Skeletons! Like, like, how wasn't I gonna lose my collective mind over that? And then flip it over and it says, The most fun you will ever have with the skeleton. The Emperor needs necromancers. The ninth necromancer needs a swordswoman. Gideon has a sword, some dirty magazines, and no more time for undead bullshit. Like, this book was made for me. We get this book, and it just takes everything within my power to not read it right away. And Chelsea's building this schedule, and I'm like, Chelsea, you can't. You can't make, like, I don't care, I'm gonna read this book. This is the first book I'm reading. And Chelsea's like, I know, it's fine. And then so she's reading it, and she's like, oh my god, it's so good! And I'm like, okay, I'm getting to it, I promise. I promise. Alright, I'm reading it. Oh my god, it's so good. Oh no. Cause you know when there's that book, or that movie, or there, that game that you are very hyped for, and there's that little voice in the back of your head that's like, what if it's not good? You've like put so much time and energy just <laughs> hyping yourself up for this. Like for example, Kingdom Hearts 3 comes out and I've been waiting for that for like 15 years. <laughs> if that hadn't been great, ugh. Lesbian necromancers in space exploring a haunted gothic mansion, like come on! <laughs> <laughs> this is like the book that I wanted to write. <laughs> but I would have never done this book justice. It's beautiful and perfect the way it is. <sighs> so. <laughs> All right, a summary of this book, and there's lots of spoilers in between. So if you haven't read this book, maybe don't let us spoil it for you. Go and read yeah, it first. Yeah, this is definitely one that I would suggest go into blind. But if you are looking at us from the future and you've read this book and the second book is coming out and you want to hear the plot, stay tuned. And, Hi, uh, people. I'm so jealous of you. <laughs> so jealous. Yeah, all right. So Gideon is a servant of the ninth house and the ninth house serves the emperor and she is one of the last young people left from the ninth she's house. She's about 18 or 19. Yeah. The only other young person in this house, everybody else is like god-awful ancient, <laughs> is Harohark, the necromancer of the ninth house and the leader of the ninth house. And come to find out that Gideon just kind of like fell from space <laughs> Her mother kind of like tried to like save her, but her mother died and they tried to like bring her back to figure out who she was and why she had this kid and why they, she ended up in the ninth house. And all they could get out of the mother was Gideon, 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 and then her soul just kind of disappeared. So they named her Gideon and they went about their way. And then it turns out that the lord and lady of the ninth house could not conceive a child and they needed to conceive a necromancer, so they decided to murder all 200 children under their care. <laughs> in order to bring about a powerful necromancer child. <laughs> and so they poisoned them, but somehow Gideon survived. Yeah, they like pump like gas through the air vent. And, and Gideon is literally right beside the air yeah. vent. <laughs> so they're like, what the fuck is this kid? And so the Lord and Lady of the Ninth House are like low-key terrified of her. <laughs> because they're like, ah. And so Gideon grows up in the Ninth House and they try to make her into a nun and that doesn't work. <laughs> and they like finally decide, okay, we'll train her to be like a swordswoman. And she really likes that. She has a big two-handed sword. She's very violent. She's just... I love her so much. <laughs> she's super violent. She will punch first and 
and like ask questions later but she's definitely a nice person like she likes people because she hasn't met too many people and so she wants to leave the ninth house just kind of enlist in the army go to the front line serve the empire not as a ninth person because she wants away from the creepy ninth house cult and she's trying everything she's made many escape attempts i think it said in the book that her first escape attempt was at the age of six <laughs> <laughs> she's got it all planned out She's like figured it out, she's got a ship coming for her and she's gonna get on this ship but then Haro Hark gets in the way and she tricks her into fighting her and doing what she says and of course Haro Hark who was one step ahead of Gideon wins and Gideon is forced to come and listen to what Haro Hark wants. Now, and I love her so much too! <laughs> <laughs> Haro Hark is the necromancer, she's the one who her parents killed all the children for and she hates Gideon! <laughs> and Gideon hates her! and they hate each other forever and ever and always. And now they're being forced to work together, but they don't exactly work together because they don't want anything to do with one another, and it's just, it's it's great. They're on like the petty level of spite too. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna like rip a hole in all your pockets or something, like yeah. just to piss you off. Like they're at that level of like any, any little thing I can do, I'm gonna do it just to like irritate you. And so one of the joys of this book is watching them kind of become friends. <laughs> and so slowly work together and actually realize that they enjoy each other's company. <laughs> it's like having two cats and you're introducing them and it takes about like six weeks and then all of a sudden they're just like all right you're fine I guess. <laughs> Haro Hark is very like very controlled, she's very clever, she wants to be the smartest person in the room. She is very much aware that she is composed of like 200 dead souls of children. Yeah, that was a really fucked up scene. <laughs> it really was. But, so the ninth house was originally a cult, this is so much fun, <laughs> and they just were supposed to like do a thing for the emperor and then like disappear but they built a cult around it and so like they creep out the rest of the universe. There's, okay so there's this tomb it's supposed to stay locked because like the emperor's like ultimate nemesis like his death basically is locked in this tomb and so their job was to make the tomb and then die protecting the tomb like lock, their se lock themselves in the tomb but they don't! And everyone's like... <sighs> <laughs> and Haro Hark, being like a smart, like, I don't know, like six-year-old, eight-year-old, something like that, decides that, you know what? Fuck it. I want to go in there. So she does, and she gets all the way to the end where she shouldn't have been able to get. And then her parents are so horrified that she did this and that she, like, no. slandered their religion or whatever that they commit suicide and she has to like puppet them around. Yeah, that's fucked up too. <laughs> She's like, yes, my parents have taken a vow of silence because they are so pious. And it's actually like, <laughs> she's like controlling them. <laughs> They're like super dead. <laughs> so Gideon has to become her cavalier, which is basically like her knight bodyguard, like sidekick. She has to train with like a rapier instead of her two-handed sword, which is like very upsetting for her. <laughs> And then they get to go to the first house, which is this kind of like decrepit, once grand mansion on this planet that everything is dead, but it's like super bright, like kind of like the exact opposite of like the ninth house. The picture like a like a 1920s mansion, you know, big swimming pools, like yeah. super big bathrooms, and like there's just windows everywhere, but everything is just kind of like faded into decay. And you've got mo like mold and Moss. you're basically going from like the chronicles of Riddick with the necromongers to like Gatsby's house 50 years down the line after no <laughs> one's been living there. Like it is a weird switch <laughs> but it works. It, yeah it makes total sense because you plan it. They get there and they meet all these other cavalier um, necromancer teams. There's eight in total including them and they're told that hey, the emperor needs new lictors. What is a lictor? It's like basically like a super undead revenant. They're just on another level. You're like level 99 necromancer. Like <laughs> your DM does not know what to do with you at this point. <laughs> like you're, you're gonna one hit anything that comes up against you. They're told, hey, in this house, there is a way to become a lictor. You can work together. You can not work together, just sabotage each other. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. But uh, the only thing you cannot do 
is open a door that you haven't been given permission to open. That's it. That's all I got for Have you. Have fun, kids. Bye! Gideon and Haro meet the other houses, and there's, like, Abigail and Magnus, who are, like, this really cute domestic couple. There is Isaac and Jean Marie, who are their teen wards. There's Dulcinea, who's, like, dying beautifully of cancer. <laughs> She's, like, weeks away from kicking the bucket, and her very, very quiet, brooding um, cavalier. And then there's um, Palamedes and Camilla, who are like besties, but they're very clever and like kind and competitive. They're great. And then there's the two, the the twins who like the one twin just keeps chewing on their cavalier, like eating the cavalier. It's, it's so weird. creepy. I'm like, oh! Yeah, they're Ianti and Corona yeah. Beth. Cavalier Babs. <laughs> yeah. And like the one thing that struck me right off the bat is like all of the different types of necromancy. Yeah. Like, all of it. It's all there. And I was just, I was so happy. <laughs> like you've got like the traditional like bone necromancer who can just kind of like pop a skeleton. You have like the very bone. like scientific necromancy, like cabal, more like ritual. You have like drawing on your own pain, like the fact that Dulcinea's dying makes her like super strong and it turns out her house kind of tries to manufacture that kind of like border like borderline between life and death because they draw their strength from that. You've got like people who talk with souls. It all just kind of depends on who you are and where you're from and that's the kind of stuff you do. Now it turns out that this place, this mansion that they're like discovering and they have like, they find like little challenges like they find a locked door and Haro and Gideon finally have to start to work together because it's only a test that can be done with a ca cavalier. So that's when they kind of start to work together but then you have like keys to other rooms and there's only a certain amount of keys they figure out so other people have different keys so if you want to kind of like figure out everything that's happening you kind of have to talk. <laughs> yeah you kind of have to work together and get other people's keys but they don't figure that out until like real close to the end. It's kind of like almost like an escape room where like after you solve a puzzle you get an answer and then after you solve a bunch of puzzles, it all works together to get this big formula of how you become a lictor. And we'll get to that at the end because it's real fucked up and I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> and I spoil the review. Meanwhile, there's this big creepy weird monster that's picking everybody off and they, at first they think that it's part of the underground laboratories because like the stuff that happened in the underground laboratories was really fucked up and we did really dark necromancy shit so of course <laughs> like lots of people died down there so it's like super haunted and you know like ghosts and spirits can do stuff here so ooh, be careful don't go down there alone but there's this big creepy <laughs> monster that just starts like plowing through people and like no one's safe like everybody dies <laughs> like the first to go is your happy like cute domestic couple and you're like no i like them and then like the second to go dulcinea's cavalier there. yeah and then the third to go is like isaac and jean marie the really cute whiny teenagers and like that really upsets gideon because she was down there with them and so she watches them die and she manages to get the girl out and like they sleep in this room and she wakes up and she's dead and she's just like, ha! Ah! <laughs> the fuck? The fuck? And it really fucks her up. And of course you have like infighting slowly developed because nobody knows what's happening, nobody knows what the point of everything is. And there's been one of the rules for coming there is there can be absolutely no contact with the outside world and people start dying and so they want to contact the houses of those people to be like, hey, guess what, I'm sorry, but like your necromancer is dead. But they can't do that because that would break the, the rules. I forget which set is like, we have to bring in backup. Like this the is- The second house. Yeah, the second house is like, no, we need to bring in the military there is something seriously wrong here we need to you know bring in the big guns bring the emperor and they're like no we can't bring the emperor here for reasons why no one can be here the second house is literally the most boring house. that's <laughs> all they do is be like we should call people and everybody's like we can't call people they're like we should call people and then they die <laughs> yeah, so meanwhile Gideon is kind of like starting up a romance with Ducinia and Haro is kind of jealous and it's not exactly like a romantic jealous, it's like, you are mine, we have a job, we have to save the ninth house, keep it in your pants, she's probably using you. And, and Gideon's like, but she's literally like, she can't sit up by herself. <laughs> Meanwhile, like, 
Haro finally, like, kind of starts to trust people the more she talks to the Palomides, and, like, that's really cute, too, because they're kind of, like, they're on the same level, and they, like, mutually respect each other's genius, but they can, like, one-up each other because they have, like, different specialties. It's really adorable. Do we want right. to get into the shit show? Okay, okay. so I'm just going to preface this with after I finished this book, I sat in, like, a dark room for, like, an hour and just texted Chelsea and was like, don't finish this book. <laughs> finish this book, but... <sighs> okay. So, my major issue, other than it's kind of hard to track all of the characters at first because there's just so many of them, is that the secret to becoming a lictor is really obvious, and I think she did this on purpose. You basically have to eat your cavalier. You have to, like, suck them in. Like, like you, eat their soul. Like, yeah. So you, they can kill themselves willingly, or you can kill them, and then you eat their soul, and you become one. And it's built right into the cavalier system. That is why that they use a rapier, because, you know, those, like, weak, willowy necromancer arms can... <laughs> That's all they can do is yeah. hold up a little thin thing. We find this out when Ianthe finally, like, snaps and kills her necromancer. Her, her cavalier. Or, yeah, her cavalier. And eats Babs. Like, yeah. eats him for real this time. <laughs> and you get this really weird relationship dynamic because you find out that Corona Beth, like, the g tall, gorgeous one who's always kind of walking around, and Ianthe was always kind of, like, the quiet, like, dull one, you find out that she actually isn't a necromancer, and that, like, Ianthe has just been kind of pretending for her. And then you find out that, like, Corona Beth is like, why did you eat him? You could have just eaten me. And you're like, what?! What? So they have to fight them, and then we find out the big twist is that Dulcinea is actually not Dulcinea. Dulcinea was murdered on the way too, and has been replaced by a real live fucking lictor. So it turns out that Dulcinea is actually a lictor named Cytheria. So she was dying. She became a lictor, her and her cavalier, because they thought it would save her. Like, you know, immortality. But the thing is, lictorhood kind of freezes you where you are, and so she's just in a constant state of dying. And I mean, it makes her like even more powerful, but like, she's in a constant <laughs> state of dying. <laughs> and so now Gideon et al. have to fight her, and they are so outclassed. And when I say Gideon et al., basically everyone is dead at this point. Yeah. Palamedes has like, turned himself into a nuclear bomb to fuck up Cyrethia. Find out that he was in love with Dulcinea and they had been exchanging letters all this time and then he was really one of the reasons he agreed to come was he was gonna finally meet her and like there was something off about her but she seemed to be getting along with Gideon and Gideon thinks that she's a homewrecker because she's ruining the relationship mm -hmm. but he kind of like is okay with it because he's like Gideon makes her happy it's fine and then he finally confronts her and like realizes it's not she's not who she says she is and he turns himself into a cancer bomb yeah and so he's dead we have camilla who's finally just like oh my god like well this bitch has got to die and then you've got ianthe who's become a lictor but she's like a baby lictor like she doesn't know how to use her powers yet so while she does get some real good hits in on cyrethia Cyrethia ultimately like throws her to the ground and rips her arm off <laughs> and then starts like eating her. So it comes down to our girls Haro and Gideon and they're hiding under this big bone shield and Haro's like we are going to we're gonna die we're gonna die like this is it we're gonna die and Gideon is like I wanted to fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, but like, I did. <laughs> and so then Gideon is like, okay, there's one way out. And Haro is like, don't you fucking dare, you bitch. And Gideon is like, hey, I mean, you're made up of 200 fucking dead people. What's one more? And you're just sitting there holding this book like, oh no. <laughs> it's happening. And Gideon falls on her sword and is like, you better eat me. And then Haro eats Gideon and they have this kind of like <laughs> conversation in Haro's brain where Gideon's like I'm not actually me I'm just like the version of you that your brain is like conjured up to make you feel better here I'll show you how to fight and so Haro ends up kind of becoming a lictor and she's so smart that she figures out how to dismantle Cyrethia and she does and that's when the Emperor shows up and is like Hey, 
So... This wasn't how this was supposed to go down. I mean, I really need some more electors and like... We're gonna be fighting basically the end of the universe, like the heat death of the universe, but I, I, you know, this had to be a choice that you had to make. Like, you had to realize just how big this was. I didn't want it to just, like, happen. But now that you're here, what do you want to do? <laughs> and she's like, can we bring Gideon back, back? And he's like, no. No, we can't. And she's just like, oh. Oh god, okay, I guess let's go fight the big bad thing. <laughs> and then, like, and, and it's just like, you're just like, that's it. But, but I loved her. Yeah. But I really loved her. Yeah. <laughs> you know. The book was named after her. <laughs> you can't do this. This is a contract. <laughs> no. And so you go through this entire book knowing, okay, obviously the lictor and to become a lictor, your necromancer and your cavalier have to like merge. But not like that. But you did, but you did. You know it's coming, but you don't, you're not emotionally prepared for it, you know, like... You kind of assume that they're gonna look at it and they're be like, oh, that's ultimate pair. We don't need that, we're better, like, <laughs> as complimenting peace. No, it's fine, you're, I'm falling in love, people, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. So, like, cut to me just, like, openly sobbing as I, like, turn the page as Gideon is dead and Chitaro is having this conversation in her mind. And it's just, it's, like, the worst feeling because, like, you're not, like, you're really attached. Like, this is not... Nice. So there were three of us reading this book. I was the one who I finished first and then I had to sit there in my feelings and wait for Chelsea and our friend to catch up with me. Oh god. So I think Gideon is going to come back. Not anytime soon, but I think she's going to come back. I, she I, does not think she's I, gone. I think she's gone. I think that if Gideon were to come back it would undercut the entire emotional like construct of the book. There, like you mentioned, how Dulcinea talks about like you remind me of someone else. I think it could even be Gideon is named after another Gideon, or maybe when the mom was crashing into the world, she wasn't shrieking for her child. She was shrieking for like actual Gideon, and the ninth house being the ninth house are just like, oh, okay, I guess the baby's name is Gideon, guys. <laughs> this is Gideon. Look. Gideon. <laughs> also, they filled her with a room full of poison and she did not die. There's no reason, like, they have not given a reason for that. I, I think she's gone, like... I don't know. Would you be super mad if she came back? Kind of, actually, because, <laughs> like, okay, on the superficial level, that I would feel like you're taking, you made me go through the pain, let me, like, let me move on. Don't, like, drag me back to that. <laughs> on the, on another level, it's like, it undercuts the whole, like, the sacrifice that she makes and, like, Haro's baggage for the next two books. Unless Haro doesn't make it through the second book, because the third book is named after someone else who I am, like, 95% sure is the, the, the girl in the, the tomb that Haro's kind of into because Haro's like, I want to be there when she wakes up. Hey. <laughs> I don't know. I think if Gideon came back for the last book, I would be okay with that. I I like my consequences. Yeah, but she can suffer a whole fucking book, <laughs> and I'm good. But I mean, I'm not writing it, so we'll see. Anyways, that was our review of Gideon the Ninth. We highly recommend you read it. Yes, because. I can't believe I have to wait who knows how long for the next one because it's killing me. I, I'm so mad. It's killing me slowly. <laughs> yep. So I'm gonna say something very, like, controversial. I kind of want this book more than I want Queen of Nothing. Oh my god. Like, <laughs> I, yeah, like, I want, I want, yeah, that's, that's my controversial opinion. <laughs> Alright, so we will see you guys next time. Bye.